Well, I want to welcome everyone to season one, episode one the first. of the Everybody Leads podcast. My name is Aaron. My friends call me AJ, and I am here with the founding and lead pastor of LifePoint Church, Jeff Capusta. Good to be with everybody. Good to have you on the very first podcast. This is awesome. Yeah. Now, we are uh, just coming off our Easter services, just to give you a little context for when we're having this conversation. And Easter was incredible at LifePoint. Record attendance. Uh, why don't you tell us a little more about that experience? Basically, every record that we've set as a church was broken this Easter. It was pretty amazing. And obviously, we don't do what we do to break records. We do it to reach the one. But if you are effectively reaching the one, you're going to break records, and it is exciting. So we saw our highest attendance ever. We had 3,613 people across both That's of our incredible. locations. Yeah. And uh, that was largely due to the fact that we were able to open up our balcony for the first time ever, came down to the wire. What? Balcony? Yes. Tell us about that one. Pine <laughs> Valley. So, so we started this project back before Hurricane Florence, and uh, it got slowed down because of Florence. We, we went through the holiday and um, had a couple week buffer, but as construction projects go, we hit some delays. It came down to the wire and we made it, which was amazing because uh, five services at our Pine Valley campus, two at our Leland location, one online, and uh, the 8.30 Sunday morning when I saw the balcony beginning to fill up, man, that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, 10.30, the balcony was full, the annex was full, and people were sitting in the lobby and it was amazing. And, and probably the, the coolest part for me was that 8.30 service when we got to the very end and people were raising their hands saying, I put my trust in Christ and I saw hands up in the balcony. Yeah. And you're like, you know what? If we hadn't created the space, then I don't know. I mean, maybe they would have been in the annex. Who knows? It's hard to fill in the blanks of the story, but yeah. people got saved. We saw 131 people uh, tell us that they put their faith and trust in Jesus. And That's so- incredible. You know, it was exhausting uh, for sure, but that's that's why we do what we now, do. Now you recovered. I mean, it. <laughs> I'm good now. Several Five days. services. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine. You know, it's interesting. So, uh, so we did two on Saturday night, and then three on Sunday morning, and um, that breakup, I th I think, felt pretty good. So when Sunday afternoon rolled around, all I wanted to do was go home. I grilled steaks. I put my feet up. But uh, Monday morning, got up and kind of, you know, we had the day off. Our staff had the day off, but. I felt pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So recovered. I so think ready feel good for the pop-up Easter service on Monday evening, <laughs> right? No. <laughs> I'm glad Monday was a little bit of a breather, for sure. For sure. Well, good. Let's, uh, let's talk a little about the church. Uh, you've been leading LifePoint for 13 years now. Yes. 13 years. I've been on staff, had the privilege of serving with you for nine of those. I know. Isn't that, Isn't that amazing? That's yeah, absolutely it, amazing. Last place I ever thought I would be is on staff at a church, especially uh, serving really? the pastor. And you, so. <laughs> <laughs> you, had, you had higher hopes and dreams and you've settled. Just different. Different. <laughs> I, didn't know, uh, I didn't know that I would make it to this age. That will be that? an episode in and of itself, <laughs> will be the, the journey of Aaron Johnson. So we can revisit at that. But um, tell us a little about your leadership journey. I know that I've heard you say that you didn't always think of yourself as a leader. And so it's true. to be leading a church of this size, it's funny, I get to hear you say all the time, this is the biggest church I've ever been a part of. And it keeps, as it grows, that, that statement continues to be true. And so how have you navigated that over the years? You know, I think a lot of times people will say, did you think this is what LifePoint would look like 13 years in? And, and every year, it seems like every time it was our birthday, people would ask that question. And my answer has always been, I'm not really sure we would have ever made it past like the, the year one or year two, because this wasn't something I ever dreamed of. Yeah. I, I never thought, well, I can't wait to pastor a church someday. I had my own plans and it didn't involve pastoring. It involved being in the business sector. And I really thought that's what God had ahead of me. Um, and so never saw myself in this role, never saw myself as a, a, an upfront, rally the troops, cast vision kind of leader. And if I'm being honest, it, you know, even in my insecurities, there's moments when I find myself going, there's a lot better people to do what I'm doing. So I never really saw myself as a leader. I probably would have even told you I'm not a leader which I think is hilarious. You know, the Bible says that God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. I'd like case in point right here. Um, 
It is the biggest church I've ever been a part of. I grew up in a great Bible teaching church, but on a big Sunday, maybe a hundred people. Mm-hmm. So I uh, was in youth ministry for eight years, loved it, thought I'll spend the rest of my life there. And I think God allowed youth ministry to get me exposed to an organization called the ARC, the Association of Related Churches, yeah. where uh, just when I thought I had life figured out, God was like, yeah, watch this. And I started having this crazy feeling to plant a church. And I'm like, no, literally, God, you have the wrong guy. I am not that. I'm, you know, I had this idea that pastors are good at everything. Yeah. Like they can, man, they, they, they preach, they study, they counsel, they... They, they do systems and strategy. They Weddings, run these funerals. Exactly. They know all the right things to say in every situation. Right. And then there's me. <laughs> I, I just want to drink coffee and hang out with people. And, and, and I like preaching, but I'm not sure I'm that great at it. And so um, I think I was caught off guard just as much as everybody else that this is something that I felt like God put ahead of us. So yeah. 13 years. It's, uh, I think, a testimony to just keep showing up and let God do his thing. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, like I said, I've had the privilege of serving on staff with you for nine years. When I came on staff, I was like, man, this guy is full of wisdom, but I didn't even know what I didn't know, yeah, right? Full and of so something. I've, <laughs> I've gotten to see you grow over the course of time. And uh, even this podcast is something you've been wanting to do for a while. And so, you know, 13 years in, why now? Why, why did you decide that this is something you want to do at this moment? So every year, it seems like God puts a theme on my heart. And we have been working a lot internally at the church on leadership systems and structure. And I feel like we've, we've been internally developing a lot. And I felt like as we turned the corner for this year, God put this theme of lead on my heart. And that I felt like I had been focused a lot on preaching, but not so much on leading. And I think that for me, God is desiring my leadership more than my preachership. And I began to really start thinking through, what does it look like to lead? What does it look like to lead um, in all different facets, not just church leadership? And I felt like this idea got put on my heart that, that everybody leads. Yeah. That, I mean, not everybody would call themselves a leader. Matter of fact, I would have tried to talk you out of this. It's like, no, no, I'm not a leader. I'm not leadership material. Yeah. I had that conversation with God. But the more I've begun to understand how we're wired and even what Scripture says, I just believe that, that everybody is a leader, but not everybody's a good one. Mm-hmm. So I think everybody leads, but not everybody's a good leader. And so this podcast came about from this idea of how can I help take the, the principles that I feel like God has been working in me, share those with others to develop leaders across our entire church and really across the, the landscape of the church yeah. and even the business sector. Yeah, and I've gotten to hear some of those principles, so uh, I, I think this podcast is going to be a great avenue for uh, learning. And then I've heard you say, you know, we found ourselves uh, in the church, we were like, man, if we just had some more leaders, you know, and I've heard you also say it's kind of like planting a tree. Like the best time to do it is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. So. Right, right. So truthfully, I wish we had started this podcast, you know, 13 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 13 years ago, I don't think I would have shared the content that I would share today. There yeah. was, uh, you know, 13 years ago was this young 29-year-old, highly insecure, and I don't mean like I've gotten over all of that, but highly insecure pastor that found himself in a position he never thought he was going to be in. Yeah. And so there was a lot of, I think, just figuring out what in the world I was doing back then. And so it has been, it's been quite the journey. I mean, I've always thought, and I think people do, that leaders are born. Yeah. And I think that there is a gift of leadership. The Bible speaks to that. But I think leaders are developed. Leaders are made. Um, I think leadership is a decision. And, and so I always thought, well, you know, the leader's like the, the kid that's the captain on the team and, you know, they're, they're the head of the class and yeah. they're the ones that are speaking at graduation and they get the scholarships and that's leadership. Well, I was none of that. I was, I mean, none of that. So I, I, everything I thought qualified you for, to be a leader, I felt like I wasn't. Uh, on the academic front, I wasn't exactly top of the class. I was a solid C student. Yeah. I was like, how, what do I have to do to pass? Okay, I don't have to do homework. Cool, I'm not going to do homework. So I, I didn't really apply myself. My SAT scores were 
were rough. They're so bad when I tell people what they were, they're like, was that w- which, which part? And I'm like, no, the whole thing. <laughs> and, and so I just, I didn't see myself in that capacity. As a matter of fact, I, I can recall when I was getting ready to step out of student ministry into starting a church, a leader that I looked up to greatly said, said, Jeff, there's three things every great church planner needs to have. They've got to have a passion for the lost. Man, you've got that. They've got to have ability to communicate, and you're, you do a pretty good job there, and they've got to be a strong leader. And they said something that crushed me. They said, I don't think you're a strong leader. Mm. And it was like, I knew I wasn't a good leader, but I thought I was at least good at faking it. And <laughs> as it turns out, maybe I wasn't, and, and I felt like I felt naked. I felt vulnerable. I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm not good. And so what that did is that caused me to avoid you know, leadership opportunities. Yeah. I would, uh, you know, I, I, w- I would relegate it. I would like pass it off to somebody else. I would abdicate it. I'd dump it on people. Uh, deleg- I, anything that kept me from having to make decisions, call the shots. And yet I've realized that over time, like God's called me to it. Yeah. Not, not just in the church capacity, but in life. And if I wait on everyone else to make the decisions, I'm going to miss out on doing what God's called me to do yeah. and being who God called me to be. And so I've got to learn to lead because everybody leads. Okay. And so how did that revelation come about? I mean, you, you know, were you reading a story in the Bible or something like that? Or, you know, hey, I've got I've to really grab a hold of this leadership calling. And, and uh, you know, how did, what were your next steps in that? I mean, how did you learn to become a leader? Yeah. Well, it's been a long journey for sure. Um, my business card says lead pastor. So there's that. I was like, well, I guess I have to do that. Leading is, is part of it. And at the end of the day, when uh, your, your team, whether it's volunteers or staff, are looking at you to make a decision, at some point you have to step up and do it. Which I always thought was funny that the lead pastor is like the main guy. When I first walked into church and I heard that there was an executive pastor, I'm like, oh, this guy must be up top. Like This, <laughs> this is actually the head of the church. Well, I think <laughs> And then so, there's a senior pastor, and I'm right. like, well, that just sounds like an old guy. So. Really, in, in, our, in our language, <laughs> lead pastor is senior pastor, but senior sounds old. So maybe I'll take on that title You know, now that I'm approaching old. Uh, but you know, you ask about like, all right, was there a, was there a Bible story? So here was, this was a big revelation for me. So Jesus is teaching in Matthew, it's in Matthew 25 and then in Luke chapter 19, but he teaches this parable called the parable of the talents. Mm -hmm. And the gist of it is this, I won't read you the story, but it just says that there's this, um, this master's going away on a journey and he grabs three of his servants and he says, all right, um, I'm going to, I'm going away. I'm going to give you these talents. Now a talent was like an amount of, of money. And so he gives one of them five talents. He gives one of them two talents and then one of them one talents. And at first you're like, well, that's not really fair, but the Bible says he gave to each of them according to their ability. So we all have different abilities. Yeah. And so then he goes away and over a period of time he comes back and the guy with five talents it says that he, he put his money to work, so he invested it, and now he's got 10 talents. I mean, that's a pretty great return right there. Took five, turned into 10, and so he celebrated, well done, good and faithful servant, this is great. The guy with two talents comes back, and now he's got four talents, and he's celebrated. And then there's the guy with one talent, and he's like, ah, uh, so what happened was... <laughs> yeah, what did he do? <laughs> yeah, so he, he buries it. And he brings it back and he's like, I knew you were, you know, you're a hard man. And he goes through these excuses. And basically he was afraid. And so he just returns the one talent. Yeah. And and it's not like, well, at least you didn't lose it. He's it, what what has happened is he's like, he, he's called lazy. He's called wicked. His talent is actually taken from him and given to the guy that had ten that, that was up to the ten. So now he's up to eleven. <laughs> And as I was reading Story that, of my life. <laughs> no, I'll never get a break. That's what it felt like. And, and Favor so, ain't there. <laughs> so here's what stood out to me about this story. One, in life, everybody gets something. Everybody does. So in that story, five, two, one, everybody got something. Yeah. And, uh, the, the second thing that stood out to me was that life's not fair. Okay? <laughs> if, if you're waiting for life to be fair, you're going to spend the rest of your life waiting. It's not. And so, so, so somebody else has more talents than you. All right? Big deal. Yeah. Big deal. They may have different ability. They come from a different home. It's always, there's different things. So everybody gets something. Life's not fair. And then work what you've got. And so you've got to work what you've got. It, you are responsible for what you've been given. And I think I spent a lot of my life and my leadership looking at other people's talents, yeah. looking at what they had that I didn't have. Well, yeah, if I had five talents, I would do what they did. Well, guess what? You don't. Get over it. Life's not fair. Work what you've got. And so uh, little known fact on February 5th, 2006, that was the birthday of LifePoint, the launch day. There's another small 
uh, church in the Charlotte area that started on that exact same day. Yeah. <laughs> I spent much of the 13 year history looking at their talents, wishing I had those, wondering why they're producing more. And the reality is I can't, I can't invest someone else's talent. Yeah. And so I have to take a look and do an assessment of what I have. God, what have you given me? And, and so from a leadership standpoint, God has placed a certain amount of talents in my hands. It, they're, they're, they're mine. He's given them to me based upon my ability. It does me no good to look at your talents and to look at everybody else's and get mad and jealous and envious. Yeah, I think people get paralyzed by that all the time. Especially, exactly. Well, well, here's the thing. Especially if, the example you just gave of Pastor Stephen Furtick. And, well, I know. wasn't going to say names. <laughs> But you know, I, but, you know, pray for them. They're <laughs> yeah. they're they're doing they're doing okay. I think they're I mean, gonna make it. He's got so many millions of followers. I think people kind of knew. So, you know, they're they're familiar with the story. <laughs> so here's the thing that stood out to me is I, is is I had to come to a place where it's like, okay, what well, what have I been given? All right. And to be honest with you, I'm not a five talent leader. I am not. I am like a one to two talent leader. If we're just being honest, you know, I'll just say it. You've worked with me for nine years. You've seen a lot. Um, you've seen some highs. You've seen some lows. This guy could tell you stories. Uh, I'm I mean, a one. I would never say that. <laughs> no, well, you, so that's why I said it. So I'm a, I'm a one to two. But but here's what I would say. I would say you will not invest what you do not believe you possess. So you you've got to understand that God has given you something. He's given every single one of us talents. He's given us influence. He's given us authority. So until you own the very thing that God has entrusted to you, you're not going to do anything with it. And so the difference between the five, two, and the one guy is the five and the two worked what they had. Mm -hmm. They reinvested it. The one, out of fear, he buried it. So you have to think about it. If you're going to grow your leadership and you're going to reinvest yourself, that takes faith. But fear causes you to kind of push it aside, bury it, and, and not develop it and not own it. And what I've begun to see is that in every facet of life, I've been given talents. So as a, I mean, I think about like the areas that, that I lead, and you can think about the areas you lead. I, I'm a, you know, yes, I'm a pastor. That's the obvious. Yeah. But I'm a father. I've got three kids. And honestly, that's a greater platform than, than the stage that I preach on. I'm a husband. I'm a coach on a local mountain bike team. Uh, I, I could go on and on, but there's capacities in which I lead. And then if you're like, well, I'm not married and I'm not on staff and I'm not, okay, maybe you're a shift manager at your job. Um, maybe, you know, you, you're... Maybe you volunteer in a local organization and as a volunteer, you're offering leadership. If you're like, I don't do any of that, well, you know what? You still lead yourself. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people that want to lead other people that haven't even started leading themselves. That's good. Yeah. And so I think when I say everybody leads at some capacity, everybody is in leadership, even if the only person you lead is the one that you, you know, you brush your teeth with in the mirror every single morning yeah. and every single evening. And until you learn to lead yourself, why in the world would God ever entrust you with the capacity to lead other people? So I think it's about developing that. So that, that's where it all stemmed from was this idea that I have been entrusted with talents and abilities, so have you. What are we doing with it? Because at the end of the day, everything we have comes from God, and we're going to give an account for it. Yeah. So let's start working it. Let's start reinvesting it. And so that's how, all that sounds great. That's um, awesome. What, do, what can people do? What's the next step? Like, okay, so I don't feel like I'm a leader. You know, maybe I just uh, had this revelation that I am a leader. God is calling me to lead. What, what does my first step look like? Like, how do people walk this out? Well, you know, I, yeah. you can't just walk around saying, you know what, I'm a leader. And so I need you, you know. Well, it's easy. So, so the thing about leadership <laughs> is it can be paralyzing because, you, you know, you listen to something like this and you're like, that's it. I'm going to lead. And you realize nobody's following you because you haven't earned the right to, uh, to lead. Yeah. So you've got to start with yourself. And I think that there's, there's, there's five aspects. We could probably add more to it, but there's at least five aspects personally that everybody can, can lead in. And so I, several years ago, I, I preached a message on being intentional, and I talked about five I will statements that will change your life, change your year. And I think you can apply these I will statements to these five areas. And the five areas are this, there's physical, spiritual, relational, emotional, and financial. Okay. These are five areas. If you're not careful, you will be a victim. You'll pretend that life happened to you rather than you happening to life. So like physical for a moment, think about this. I am responsible for my physical body. If I can't lead myself physically, th then what right do I have to lead other people? And what do I mean by that? I, I mean like um, 
physically speaking, a lot of people you talk to are like, well, I wish I could lose weight. I wish I could, I wish I could. Well, why can't you? It's not that you, you can't, it's that you won't. And so physically speaking, I mean, I think back to, a, you know, case in point, when I started Life Point Church, I was 40 pounds heavier than I am today. Oh. <laughs> 40 pounds. That's a ton. That's a lot. 2009, yep. okay? So backstory <laughs> on AJ and I, 2009, I was beginning to get in shape and I was looking for somebody to run with me. I wanted to start running. Why in the world I was, wanted to run is beyond yeah, me. Still don't get that. I, yeah, me either. <laughs> So we start running together, yeah. and then we got from like you know a mile to two miles to four miles to five. And when you cross over like the five, people begin thinking something's wrong with you. They're like, "What are you guys training for something?" And something hit me. I was reading a Donald Miller book, and he has a quote in there. I'm probably going to butcher it, but it says something like this: "Everybody wants to live a great story, but few people want to put in the work because joy yeah. costs pain." Yeah. Something, something to that effect. I'm probably butchering that. Donald would probably never listen to my podcast. But anyway, it's a great quote. And, and I thought, you know what? I want to live a great story. And out of that, I was inspired to just say, you know what? I'm running a marathon. Let's do it. You and I talked about it. We picked Charlotte's Thunder Road. Yep. And December of 2009, we ended up running a marathon. It was it, something changed when we said, I'm doing it. Yeah. We're going to do it. And I think for a lot of people, physically, it's that I'm, I'm going to, and then you figure it out, I'm going to start eating better, and here's yeah. how. I'm going to get a gym membership, and I'm going to start using it three days a week. I'm going to start walking every, like, you are responsible. Nobody can lose weight for you. Like, the thing about, about these, you know, it's like going to the dentist. Like, I know you don't want to go, but nobody can do it for you, so, so you just do it. <laughs> and, uh, and so anyway, I think physically speaking, that's a, that's a big part. Yeah. Now, uh, even, even with that, clearly, I didn't want to run. I had never run more than a mile in my life. I remember you, uh, this will date us a little bit, you, you tweeted out that, hey, any guys in the church want to want to start running? And uh, that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do, wake up early and start running. But what I was interested in doing was growing. Yeah. And so I wanted to get around the pastor, be able to, you know, pick your brain on some things. And, and uh, that's kind of how the whole thing began. Um, yep. yep. Yeah, you were the only response I had to that tweet. So <laughs> there weren't so. a lot. I remember about four guys showed up to the first, and then uh, it quickly thinned out, and it was just the two of us. <laughs> it did. It did. So let me let me. Hit, okay, so we talked about physical, but spiritually. Yeah, I believe that you are as close to God as you want to be. So people are like, I want to be closer to God. I wish you know this and that. Well, okay, draw near to God, and He'll draw near to you. So what are you doing to to grow? And I don't think that you need to like, you know, go and I'm going to fast and I'm going to do this and I'm going to like, I think those are great things, but yeah. what's one step? So spiritually, maybe it's choosing a, a Bible reading plan and invite friends to do that with you. It's making the decision. I'm going to become consistent in my church attendance. Yeah. It's deciding I'm going to go through, I'm going I'm to get onboarded at my church at LifePoint. We call it growth track. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow and stretch spiritually. I'm going to begin to put God first, you know, from a financial standpoint. There's things that you can do. There, there are steps. Yeah. You don't have to do it all, but that one step, that saying, I will, is saying, I'm now going to, going to lead myself. Yeah, that's good. We were just, uh, you know, uh, I'm part of a freedom group. We do those here at LifePoint. And uh, last night, we were just talking about that. Uh, several, several guys all the time, they're like, you know, I just don't feel like I'm growing in my walk with Christ. And it's like, well, have you done the last thing that he told you to do? Right. Like, you're not taking any steps. And I even quoted you. I said, Pastor Jeff says all the time, you're as close to God as you want to be. And the people that are taking steps in the group are definitely growing, and you can see it. I mean, it's infectious, and it impacts mm -hmm. everyone. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, so physical, spiritual, and then relational. Relational. You, you have got to take responsibility for your relationships. And so if you're married, that's your spouse. Yeah, that's your spouse. That you, there should be some leadership. I know for my wife and I, we get lazy in this, but like Tuesday night for us is date night. We're going out. We're going to do it. And um, unfortunately, you know, lately it's been more of this. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? But what we've done in the past is we've been strategic about it. We've said, all right, one week a month, I'm responsible for picking where we go. The next week, you're responsible. The week after that, we go out with friends. The the week after that, we play attraction guide roulette where we just start flipping through the book. With the coupons, <laughs> and we pick one. Yeah, we do the same thing. And as long as you know, but but what that does is that puts somebody in leadership. But you know, maybe you say, well, I don't really, I don't really have anybody that's close to me. All right, well, get in a small group. You know, get around people, invite somebody. I think a lot of us are waiting for someone to invite us. How about you take the initiative because you're a leader and you invite somebody else. Yeah. Then there's emotional. All right, you're responsible for your emotions, and unfortunately, a lot of people's emotions drive them to do some pretty dumb things. But emotionally. 
We run ourselves ragged, so we need to say, well, what is it that fills my emotional tank? What are the things that I enjoy doing that cause me to enjoy life? Mm -hmm. Um, For me, I love, there's a few things I enjoy. I, I like riding, I get into mountain biking. And when I get out and I ride, I find my brain shuts off and I just focus on the task at hand and it fills me up. It used to be surfing for me. Going to the beach is something that does that. I like roasting coffee. That <laughs> sitting out in my workshop, roaster going, feet up. I got a candle that smells like tobacco and leather. It's just, I just, I, I'm like, you know what? I really enjoy smell? this. Yeah. But emotionally, that fills me up. And, and so knowing what are those things and making it a priority to, to do it. And then lastly is financial. Financial, and honestly, for most of us, because our finances can be a mess, it causes us to not have the money to do the things that we feel like fill us. And so making a decision financially, what are some steps we're going to take? I've shared my story many times at LifePoint, but how my wife and I, we got in a mess financially. And, and you know, nobody's going to get you out of your financial mess. Like, yeah. We had to sit down, get help, say, all right, we are going to do this. We thought it would take 24 months. We got so aggressive, we got out of debt in 18, and it's changed our life. But yeah. it, it was that you've got to take ownership of that and say, I will do this. And you've already said this, you, you said this quote that, you know, the, the best time to start all this stuff was, yeah, 20 years ago, five years ago. The second best time is today. Yeah. And so if everybody leads, might as well, we might as well get better at developing these leadership skills. Yep. And someday, here's the neat thing. So let's go back to the parable of the talents. So think about it this way, all right? The guy with five reinvested it, wound up with 10. The guy with two reinvested it, wound up with four. The guy with one buried it, gets in trouble, yep. loses it. So here's the thing that stood out to me. This is when I, it, it was like a light bulb moment. So the guy with, let's go with the guy with two. The guy with two reinvests it and now has four. Mm-hmm. What if, now this is just a story Jesus made up, but what if this guy took his four talents and reinvested those, could he turn them into eight? Yeah. And if he took his eight and turned them into 16, and so on and so on, and that's when I began to realize, wait a minute, the talents you are given is a, it, it's, it's a launch pad, not a lid. You might be a two-talent leader, but there's nothing keeping you from being a 16 or a 32. The day we, we stop reinvesting and growing and saying, I will, maybe it's, I'm gonna, I will read this leadership book. I will get around people that stretch me and grow me. I will get in a healthy place financially. When we stop making these I will statements, we stop growing and ultimately we stop leading. And I think we stop, we, we lose the right to lead. Mm. And so for me, it was all about, okay, let's faithfully work what we've got, reinvest it, and let's watch what God does with that. Yeah. Man, that is so good. Episode one, that is a wrap. You will not invest what you don't believe you possess. I love that. And uh, no one personally has had a bigger impact on my leadership and my development than you. And so thank you for your time today. And thank you guys as well for chiming in. Uh, If you could help us out, just review this podcast, share it, uh, subscribe. We're going to have another episode coming up in about a month. This is what you can expect, about 30 minutes um, leadership. And so uh, thank you for joining us today. Any last words? No, it's been good. Hey, episode one's in the books. Let's do this. That's right. I'm excited about it. And I'm excited about all the change that's going to develop in our lives, families, marriages, church, community. That's it's right. going to be good. We'll see you guys in a month. <laughs>